My name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. Today, we are talking about Jane Austen's most popular novel, Pride and Prejudice. And you know, I've read this novel maybe six or seven times, and every time I pick it up to reread it, I always think, there's no way. I'm finally gonna get tired of this book. There's no way it's gonna be as delightful as the last time I read it. But it always is, and I never get tired of it. Today, I wanna kind of start off by talking about the way in which we judge and perceive Mrs. Bennet. Now, yes, we are supposed to laugh at her. Yes, she is ridiculous. Her um, sort of imagined pains and sufferings, the way she sort of puts herself up as a victim within her own family and a victim of circumstance, it's all ridiculous. That she's absolutely embarrassing, sort of like the face palm level, like, mom, can you just stop? Kind of embarrassing, absolutely true. But I kind of wanted to take a look and look at the motivations that are underlying these embarrassing and fatiguing behaviors, because I think that she really is trying to take care of her daughters. And while we have a much more favorable view of Mr. Bennett, probably because he favors Lizzie like we do, and for many of the same reasons, he really is a blamable father. The text is clear that he could have done more to put more money away for his daughters, but he failed to do so. Meanwhile, his teasing from the start about not visiting Mr. Bingley is really quite cruel to Mrs. Bennet, who has valid concerns about the future of her family. And though he jokingly points out that most of her concerns rely on the fact that he would have to die first, that's also a reasonable assumption given probably what was their age gap. At the same time, obviously Mr. Collins is odious and ridiculous, and his explicitly outlined notions of his inevitable success for, in his suit for Elizabeth really don't make it better, but they are true. He just really shouldn't say them out loud. Lizzie would do well to marry him. It would mean security not just for herself, but for her whole family by relieving them of the entail problem, which is set out from the first as a very central conflict of the book. Um, if we think about a sort of, that the story, story is about Elizabeth finding love, it's definitely about that, but it's also about Elizabeth finding security. And um, that's why the book's tension is heightened doubly or triply with her rejection of Mr. Collins. First, because it denies the security that the book sort of sets out to solve. And second, because it hands the security over to sort of like their frenemy, the Lucas family. And third, though much less compelling in its emotional power, is it puts yet more conflict between Elizabeth and her mother. And when Mrs. Bennet accuses Elizabeth of being selfish, she has ground. Like, this is not a small thing for the family to be fearful about. If the daughters don't marry well, which is a real possibility for them, and she sort of chooses not to take this opportunity that's put before them, even though Mr. Collins is absolutely ridiculous, it really keeps their family in a very vulnerable position. Because if their father dies, how quickly would they have to get lodgings, have to start working? And I think, you know, in our modern conception, it's like, oh, that's not a big deal. Like, I go to work every day. But it really puts these women without male protection in this society in a very vulnerable place. If you want to kind of compare it, you can think about, gosh, I forgot, in Persuasion, when Anne Elliot visits her friend in Bath, and her husband, it, like, basically wasted all of her money, and then he died recently, and so now she's this widow, widow in impecunious situations. She lives in this bad neighborhood. She, the most she can do is get some, like, sewing work and some embroidery work to help support herself. You know, that's kind of the, the bleak future that the Bennett sisters would be looking forward to without some other form of security to come in. So Mrs. Bennett's concerns are valid. They're very valid. Elizabeth's choice means that Mrs. Bennett and the girls are going to have to continue to sort of live on the edge of a knife, hoping that Mr. Bennett doesn't die before someone can get some kind of security. And to go back to my previous video, I mean, like that's the scenario for the Sense and Sensibility girls, right? For the Dashwood family, but it's even worse because they have even less money to their name than the Dashwoods do. And they also don't have a half-brother, however useless John Dashwood is, to sort of stand up for them and, and find them a suitable place to live and blah, blah, blah. So, taken in a prudential light, as Jane and Charlotte would urge us to do, we can really understand Mr. Collins's pr proposal as quite acceptable, even given his horrendously unpleasant personality. Just odious, just absolutely odious. 
Then, like, let's jump to Mr. Darcy's first proposal. Again, the worst proposal on the face of the planet to, like, outline all of the reasons that someone who you're trying to get to marry you is awful and wrong and worse than you. Not the best strategy for a persuasive speech. But again, if we kind of look at the context outline, if we look at the social and economic context of its society and culture, it is a profound step for Lizzie to deny him. I mean, it's just crazy. It's absolutely unexpected. Now, and again, don't get me wrong. I love these classic Elizabeth smackdowns. I absolutely love that. <laughs> Every refusal, both refusals that she does. I love her unwillingness to compromise, to follow her strong inner convictions. And it works out for her in the end because this is a romance novel and we get a happy ending. And as a reader, we never really despair of a happy ending for Elizabeth because we know what genre we're working in we, but, and we enjoy indulging in that fantasy. But, you know, if we're kind of thinking about it in its sort of like historical context, these are really, really dangerous decisions that she's making. I think it's that partially that Austen's writing right, is so masterful that we believe the fantasy so readily. All right, now I wanna switch gears here and talk a little bit about the way in which Austen's ethical views sort of get fleshed out through her novels. Austen frequently circles around this sort of like pragmatic view of ethics when it comes to marriage and the marriage market. It's a tough line to toe and it's perhaps best parsed out in Lizzie's confusing reaction to Charlotte's engagement to Collins on the one hand, for security and mercenary reasons, and Wickham's pursuit of Miss King for security and mercenary reasons. That these two events happen so close to each other in the narrative is to highlight the contradiction in her thinking. Elizabeth thinks so very poorly of Mr. Collins, who yes, is very annoying, but he's not evil. And Elizabeth thinks rather highly of Mr. Wickham, who obviously has deceived her, but and, and later in the novel turns out to be quite evil. And here we see Elizabeth pre Elizabeth's prejudices parsed out, but it also speaks to the confusing framework of what is good to do on the marriage question that Austen at least likes toying with. And again, she seems very slippery on this subject. I think this is actually a discussion that is best continued with persuasion, but a lot of times it just seems to be that a good marriage is a marriage that turns out to have been good, and there's no way to know from the beginning. Another key idea to note is that Elizabeth falls in love with Darcy after visiting Pemberley. This is partially because Darcy, having been chastised by her refusal, really takes her criticisms to heart. That's an important lesson there, men. And he behaves differently. But this is also, again, working in a long tradition of this strong connection between the land and the landowner. I've talked about it with regard to Arthurian tales, with regard to Shakespeare, with regard to wives and daughters, and here it is again. It is a very strong thing and theme in British literature in particular. So in seeing the proper and honorable way in which Darcy runs Pemberley, she gets a new insight into his character. It's not about his wealth being on display. Don't perceive it as being materialistic. It's not. It's just about, it's about the way that the servants feel about him. It's about the way that he treats his land with respect to its natural beauty. This is where, again, even like the romantic interest in landscaping in minimal and natural way sort of becomes relevant. It's about their idea of the sublime being represented in the natural landscape. All of these things are sort of classic romantic ideals, but they're still being embodied in the land and the land represents Darcy having the proper ideals and having proper behavior. And for the last topic for today, I wanted to talk about the nouveau riche. There's a big shift in the economy happening, and this is something that seems to be a point of discomfort often. At the same time that the novel supports traditional values, i.e. Lydia running off with a much older man, never getting married to him and living for him for weeks at a time in London, the narrative roundly condemns that type of behavior. At the same time, the stuffy old Catherine de Bourgh with her sickly da daughter represents the end of the old guard. At the same time, stuffy and old Lady Catherine de Bourgh with her sickly daughter represents the end of an old guard, right? And Darcy, the next generation younger, sort of bridges the gap between old money and new money, which names here are actually very important. Darcy and de Bourgh are French names. Um, this basically should be indicating to the reader that these families can 
trace their roots back to the Norman invasion in 1000 AD, like 1066 is the Battle of Hastings, right? So that is a really old family line. But Darcy hangs out with Bingley, a decidedly not French name that is further supported by the text explicitly saying that Bingley's father worked for his wealth. They don't have a family seat, right? Bingley would be the first to buy an estate for his family. And then on top of that, there's this sly little text at the end of the book, which you may not have noticed, but Darcy and Elizabeth continue to be particularly close to the gardeners, also the nouveau riche. So what we see here is that Darcy is rejecting the old guard, rejecting the Catherine de Bourgh sort of framework for interacting with the world and accepting this new, increasingly wealthy sort of middle class families, whether it be the Bingleys or the Gardeners who are coming from this trade. And I think that sort of speaks to a certain progressivism in Austen's text. So much like I talked about in Sense and Sensibility, there's a real slipperiness to understanding whether or not Austen is a traditionalist or whether she's progressive. And she's really quite a blend of both as you parse out each issue in the text. And I think that's what adds to her complexity and the delight of reading her and rereading her <laughs> and rereading her and rereading her. In the end, this is just, and I shouldn't say just, it's not merely, but it is a fantastic incarnation of the archetypal romance, which is basically the subduing of the beastly male, if you will. So yes, Elizabeth has to grow a bit. Generally, she is quite perspicacious. That she should take pride in her ability to judge people seems natural because for the most part, she really is quite able to be a good judge of character. That she was deceived by Wickham, that she was prejudiced against Darcy is, you know, a mistake. But it's not really a character flaw that she has. And in fact, you know, Darcy doesn't present himself in the best light either. So that she should judge him poorly is not entirely her fault. Elizabeth needs to add maybe just a little bit of humility to her character, but mostly she just has to change her opinion. Darcy has to change his whole approach to all of his ethics and the way that he embodies them in the world and the way that he treats other people for him to sort of like earn and be worthy of someone like Elizabeth. So this is the structure of Beauty and the Beast. Elizabeth tames her beast, if you will. The beast never really loses his power or strength. He just becomes more tolerable, I suppose. And that is what I have for you today. I'd love to hear your thoughts and observations on this wonderful book in the comments down below. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.